Welcome, everybody. My name is Nisha Sajnani. I'm the director of the program in drama therapy here at NYU. I just want to begin by saying I understand there was a train delay, and so we are going to be letting people in throughout this beginning uh, presentation, and we'll take a pause halfway through and see if we can't let more in uh, a little bit later on. I'm going to begin just by saying that drama therapy, just by show of hands, how many of you are new to drama therapy? All right, so at least five or six people. So drama therapy draws on the tools and techniques of theater, such as improvisation and role play and performance to facilitate psychological, physical, and social change. Theater is, after all, a reflection of life, as it was, as it is, as it could have been, as it could be. And whether you are on stage or in the role of witness, Theater involves transformation. This series is called Drama Therapy as Performance, and it involves live demonstrations of drama therapy for the purpose of examining how our current approaches are being used by drama therapists today and to push the boundaries of our field. We begin this series with role theory and method, a foundational approach in drama therapy articulated by the founder of the NYU program in drama therapy, Dr. Robert Landy. Tonight, you will see a demonstration of this approach as it is used in the context of supervision, where the use of improvised role play reveals the very essence of drama, which is empathy, the act of seeing through the eyes of another. Indeed, every encounter we have with each other is written on the body. It's best revealed through performance. To introduce this approach is a senior member of our faculty who has been teaching in the program for 25 years. She is a master teacher, Ms. Sarah McMullen. Hi, everybody. Role theory asserts life is dramatic, we are always in process, treatment is not meant to be curative, and struggle is normal. Furthermore, role theory maintains that throughout our life, we are challenged to navigate our complex system of roles in search of expansion, flexibility, balance, and an overall sense of well-being. Given that life is dramatic, it follows that people are role takers and role players. According to Robert Landy, in taking on a role, one is internalizing the qualities from watching and observing another. For example, the baby watching mother or father and then internalizing the qualities of this role. To play out a role or to be a role player, one acts or behaves similarly to the role model, again, behaving as mother or father. It is in this interplay, this exchange, this back and forth of me and not me, where one works through and makes meaning of internal, image and, of internal images and the external behaviors of the role. As per Robert Landy's postmodern view, an individual is not one thing, but a multitude of roles that exist in relationship to their natural counterparts, a system of personality. Viewed through this lens, there is no self, but rather a multitude of selves that exist in relationship to their counterparts. Role, therefore, is a personality construct. Robert Landy's groundbreaking work the taxonomy of roles is a system of personality curated from Western theater, categorizing archetypal roles in six domains, social, affective, somatic, cognitive, aesthetic, and spiritual. 
Each role is organized and further described by their qualities and unique characteristics, their specific function, and finally, they are organized and described by their styles as perhaps representational, more realistic, or presentational, more abstract. A key concept in role theory is that for every role, we have a counter role. Given the dynamic nature of the role system, all roles tend to seek out their natural counter roles. In a fluid system, a person is able to navigate and manage the paradox of the two roles. In the instance of a system that is less fluid, we find a level of dissonance that can result in excluding, denying, or repressing the counter role from the system. As such, Landy introduced the concept of a guide, a transitional figure serving as the bridge between role and counter role, offering a way of working through the dissonance and the possibility of balance with integration. Any role within the taxonomy can serve as role, counter role, or guide. In role theory, treatment is conceptualized as a hero journey, where the hero travels to a destination and along the way encounters and overcomes obstacles with the help of the guide figure. Often, the therapist serves as the external guide and collaborator, a supportive double, if you will, while the client searches for their own internal guide. Role method offers an eight-step process that begins with invoking the role and guiding the client in a physical, embodied exploration where a role emerges organically. The role is named, concretized, and the client begins the process of working through and playing out, exploring qualities, how the role functions in everyday life with the goal of integrating this into their role system. Building on Landy's work, I discovered role theory to be a rich foundation for training, encouraging curiosity and reflection, learning through enquiry, relational role constructs, and actively engaging in embodied explorations, a core process of drama therapy. Using this approach, treatment commences with the client's story, followed by an initial assessment, which employs the taxonomy of roles as a reference tool to identify a client's primary roles in that moment, both covert and overt. Next, we create and step in to embodied representations of the client role system. This experience of both viewing and stepping in as both observing and experiencing ego cultivates the development of embodied empathy and attunement, sensing what it might feel like for the client in that moment. We shift our understanding of the client and treatment away from a disease-based focus towards a rich, multi-layered reflection of a person's current role system and the story so far. We place the person and the story front and center. These core skills and key concepts in role theory and embodied empathy are incorporated into our training as we learn about group dynamics and individual process. It deepens our understanding of what it means to be in relationship, the both and of our work, with the intention of simultaneously bringing attention to the power base, privilege, and bias that is inherent in clinical work and instructs us in ethical practice. We work then to repair this rupture or schism by developing our ability to access embodied empathy in co-created treatment. These fundamental concepts are similarly employed in embodied supervision where story, role, relationship, and embodied empathy continue to inform and deepen our understanding of the work fostering the development and the growth of a flexible, open, and curious therapist who explores and expands their own professional role system. It takes into account the triadic relationship between client, therapist, and supervisor. Role play in embodied supervision creates movement, results in new insights, 
increases empathy towards the client, serves to make the emotional experience relational, assists in differentiating between personal countertransference and induced countertransference or induced affect, and allows for embodied feedback where supervisors can play out the supervisee's therapist role. Embodiment in clinical supervision offers a we-centric way of thinking and knowing. Tonight, we will view two approaches in embodied supervision that are informed by Robert Landy's role theory and the concept of embodied empathy. The RRAP, the Relational Roles Assessment Protocol, developed by Britton Williams, is a tool to help clinicians enhance empathy, utilizing the framework of a relational role theory and method, exploring countertransference and identifying biases in the work. Referencing the structure of the hero journey, Ms. William notes and how the challenges in the client-therapist relationship can present as an obstacle when there is a sense of feeling stuck in the work and in the relationship, noting that both client and clinician move and are moved in the work of therapy through the interplay of multiple and shifting roles, the RRAP employs creative processes to explore the therapist's emergent roles, the client's emergent roles, and the roles that emerge in the space between. That is, the roles that are co-constructed through the therapeutic encounter and process. As Ms. Williams emphasizes, deep reflections are hidden from the view of our conscious mind and live in our bodies. The RRAP leans into the wisdom of our creativity and the body to deepen our understanding, awareness, and hopefully the ethics and care of our practice. For our second demonstration, Dana Trottier applies aspects of the hero journey and a ver variation on role method to support the drama therapist with the supervisor as guide in making meaning of clinical work. In this process, the concept of therapist role responsiveness is key. At the start of treatment, the client casts the therapist into the guide role that the client thinks they need, which may differ from the role that the therapist believes the client needs. Additionally, the role the client casts the therapist in may align or misalign with the therapist's personality, or performing of the role may not serve the client well. Therapist role responsive this nan offers a reflexive, spontaneous reaction that may result in acceptance, declination, or transformation into a complementary role response. The process and development of therapist role responsiveness is achieved in supervision through the creation of an embodied case narrative that reflects the relationship between the therapist and the client. This process of embodied supervision cultivates and encourages increased flexibility and spontaneity as the therapist begins to integrate the roles they play out into their clinical role repertoire and thus expanding their professional role system. This evening, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ms. Britton Williams, along with Adam Stevens, Carlos Rodriguez Perez, Chantal George, and Dominique Darrell, offering a brief demonstration of the RRAP in an outside group supervision setting. This will be followed by Dana Trottier with Rachel Bolter and Chantal George with a demonstration of the therapist role responsiveness in body case narrative and practice in an inpatient treatment setting. Identifying client information in both of these demonstrations has been changed and composited to protect the client confidentiality. So I thought that we could pick back up where we left off last week. We were doing some work 
around your client, JJB. Yeah. And there was a lot that was coming up around some tensions, challenges emerging in the work. Mm -hmm. And so we discussed maybe moving that into the RWRAP for some deeper exploration. So does that feel okay to pick up from there today? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as we prepare to move into that, can you all just so that we can refamiliarize ourselves, also me, uh, just give me some of the key elements that you think are important to know about JJB and his treatment um, at this facility. Yeah. Um, what do we know about JB? He's 17 years old. Mm -hmm. He's a young black man. Mm -hmm. um, he lives in a residential facility, and guess mm -hmm. what? He doesn't want to be there. Mm -hmm. And he was forced to be there. Yeah. Uh, he's been abandoned by those who should, he should probably be able to trust the most. Mm. Um, I'm aware that he is short-tempered and loud, and that he pushes people away. Well, he's been bu bullied, so. He has been bullied. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And also I know that the people who are supposed to take care of him don't always treat him the right way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and something that's been really challenging for me yeah. is to hear how other staff talk negatively about JJB. They, keep, mm -hmm. they create this negative narrative mm -hmm. about him. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm really challenged by that. Okay. Yeah, but also sometimes the system, they kind of lump people like JJB. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. they make assumptions about him, they discard him. And it's not to say that JJB can't be, you know, reactive or aggressive, mm -hmm. but I think it's, it could be also a reaction to how the system, his reaction to how the system is treating mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. But it's also difficult to show up to a space where at times we don't feel welcomed by the person that is mm. there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm hearing many things, right? We're mm -hmm. talking about the way in which historically JJB, with people he's supposed to have been able to trust, mm -hmm. have not really shown up for him, right? Mm -hmm. And also we're aware that the system and even people that are working with him, um, you know, do not always perhaps treat him the way that he should be treated, mm -hmm. view him the way that he should be viewed. Mm -hmm. And also, it mm -hmm. can be hard to situate across from someone who's pushing you away, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot here. Last mm -hmm. week, when we were working, I'd asked you all to consider what you thought was important to know about JJB. Um, mm -hmm. And we put that on these post-its, right? Mm -hmm. And so some of what we've talked about just now, I think, is represented here. But just, again, as we're continuing to rewarm up to this work, if there's something that was not named just now that you feel is important to speak into the room as we do this exploration, or it was named, but you really feel like it should be amplified, mm -hmm. can we just give voice to that now? Um, okay. Disorganized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rude. Great style. Mm -hmm. Scary. Bullied. Abandoned. Too much. A few more, maybe? Provocative. Rejected. Black. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I want to deepen this a little bit, and I want to ask you, in your imagination, what would JJB say about himself? Mm. How would JJB mm. define himself? Mm. And I want you to actually put that in your body the way that you imagine JJB might say that for him. Mm. Well, I'm the shit. Mm. No, no. I'm flossy. <laughs> you don't know me. Mm -hmm. I got this. I got family. Mm -hmm. No, I don't have family. Mm -hmm. I'm scared. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're already starting to move him into the space, and I want us to continue this thread, right? Mm -hmm. Moving this into the RWRAP. Mm -hmm. And I know we've talked about the RWRAP before, but I'll just give a brief overview review, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we want to <coughs> deepen this into con continuing to think about well, what are the roles mm -hmm. that are coming up in the room, in the work with JJB, right? Mm -hmm. And so we're gonna do this in multiple ways using the RWRAP, which is one, to think about what are the roles that are emerging for the client mm -hmm. in the room? Right? And you're already doing that by bringing JJB into the space, right? And then you're going to think about, in relationship to that, though, what's coming up for you as the therapist mm -hmm. in the room? Mm -hmm. And then I want you to think about, so then what's in that shared space in between? And in this shared space, that's the roles that are co-created in the work, right? Which means that it is both informed and informs the encounter between therapist and client, right? Mm -hmm. We've been working with role for a bit, right? So I'm gonna just give you some index cards here. And I really, the invitation is to allow yourself to think of the first roles that come to mind, okay? And we're working with a shared client, so we're gonna use one RWRAP, okay. but you all will do your own individual roles. So I'm just gonna give you some index cards here to work with, and we'll spend a little bit of time doing this, and then we will 
see, did I miss you? I'm sorry. Okay, right. Then we'll see where we go. Yeah? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. place them down as you write or you can do the whole part and then put them all down at the same time. It's up to you. So let's take a look at what's here, and you can feel free to walk around, move around as you need. Um, and I'm gonna invite you to, I mean, this is now a collective view of how you all experience JJB, right? So let's start with the client's roles, and just to kind of put this in perspective, this is step one of the RAP. We're naming the roles so that we can identify what's present in the work, right? Mm -hmm. Now that we're identifying those roles, we can begin mm -hmm. to work with you know, what's coming into the space and move with that, okay? So if there's something that maybe somebody else wrote that you didn't write that resonates with your experience with JJB, just call it out in client's roles, one or two maybe. Lover. Rebel. Beast. Child. Anything At else? risk. Okay. What about in therapist roles? Privileged. Mm -hmm. Power. Judge. Protector, mm -hmm. child, mm -hmm. the unwilling hero. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what about in the space between? Healer. Friend. Artist. The detective. Mm -hmm. The ambivalent one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in taking this in and thinking about JJB, is there anyone that's feeling warmed up to stepping into some of these roles a little bit more and exploring this? Yeah. Yeah? I would like to. Dominique, okay. Mm -hmm. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is choose one role from each category that in this moment feels most resonant for you in your work with JJB, okay? Mm -hmm. And when you've done that, you can just place it right outside. Okay. Okay. Okay, so in client's roles, you have the villain. Yes. In the space in between, you have vulnerable one. Mm -hmm. And in the therapist roles, you have mother, mm -hmm. yeah? So we're gonna move this to step two, which is to move these roles into dramatic action mm -hmm. so that you can begin to work in action with the interplay of the roles that need to be explored for you in the work with JJB, which are these ones that you've chosen here. Mm -hmm. And so to do that, I'm gonna invite you to cast someone into each of these roles and to give them a stance that that role might take on and something that that role might say, whether sound, word, um, phrase, right? Mm -hmm. In the way that you imagine that role, okay? Mm -hmm. Who do you wanna cast first? Chantal. <laughs> <laughs> Can you play the role of mother? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And Dominique, show us the mother, oh. okay? Mm -hmm. I just wanna help you. Okay. And reverse roles, let's see that. I just want to help you. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, who do you want to cast next? Mm -hmm. Carlos, may you play the villain? Sure. Okay, show us the villain. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from no one. Okay, and reverse roles. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from no one. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do you want to invite? <laughs> Adam. Mm -hmm. Vulnerable one. Okay. And show us the vulnerable <clears throat> one. I see you. Do you see me? Okay. And reverse roles.
I see you. Do you see me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So, and maybe you all can take just a step back here so that Dominique can see this. Very good. And we're going to play this through again. And we're going to do it three times so that we can get a sense of this arc, okay? Mm -hmm. And when you're ready, can you give them a three, two, one? Okay. okay. Three, two, one. I just want to help you. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from anyone. I see you. Do you see me? I just want to help you. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from no one. I see you. Do you see me? I just want to help you. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from no one. I see you. Do you see me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So in looking at this, is there any one role that is perhaps pulling you, drawing you, that you want to explore a little bit more, mm -hmm. step into, yeah? Yeah. Okay. The, the, the vulnerable one. All right, space in between. So we're going to reverse roles. <clears throat> uh-huh. And we're going to play this again through three times. Mm -hmm. And this time, vulnerable one, if there's something for you that needs to shift, mm -hmm. something else that needs to be heard, shared, or expressed, you can make that shift now, okay? Okay. And this time, will you give them a three, two, one? Sure. Okay. Three, two, one. I just want to help you. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from no one. I see you. Do you see me? I just want to help you. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from no one. I see you and I hear you. Hmm. Do you see me? I just want to help you. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from no one. I see you and I hear you. Do you see me? Okay, so there was a shift there. Can we see that again in this time you implement that shift? Okay, reverse rolls. And when you're ready, a three, two, one, okay? okay. Three, two, one. I just wanna help you. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from no one. I see you and I hear you. Do you see me? I just wanna help you. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from no one. I see you and I hear you. Do you see me? I just want to help you. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from no one. I see you and I hear you. Do you see me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hold this for just one moment. And Dominique, I'm going to invite you to come over here. And if from this place, there's anything that you want to say to one part, or perhaps it's the whole of this sculpt, I'm going to invite you to do that now, okay. if there's something that you want to share, mm -hmm. okay? To the vulnerable one, you are seen. Your words matter. You matter. Hold on to that. To the villain, I know that you are much more than just the villain. And right now, you are protecting yourself. Mm -hmm. And that is okay. Mm -hmm. To the mother, you are more than enough. You don't have to try so hard. Sit and meet the villain where he is. Mm -hmm. Reverse roles. Can you help me? Yeah, so go back and let's do that again. Mm -hmm. To the mother, you are more than enough. You don't have to try so hard. Just meet the villain where he is. Mm -hmm. And reverse roles. To the mother, you are more than enough. Don't try so hard. Just meet the villain where he is. Mm -hmm. okay. Dominique, can you come over here? We're going to breathe mm -hmm. this in. We've all been offered and received some really important words. So as we take a breath in, we're going to really receive that. And as we exhale, we're going to release for now these roles. Okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, here we go. One more for good measure. <laughs> okay, and you all can take a step back just to give a bit of distance. And Dominique, from this space, are there any immediate thoughts as you think about this arc that you have um, from this experience? There are so many thoughts. Mm. 
you know, I wasn't expecting to feel so emotional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and that makes sense, right? There's a lot here, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. A lot that's, that's filling this space. And so the good news is you get to take a breath, mm -hmm. right? And let that percolate and settle. And we're gonna hear from the roles, if there's anything that, from stepping into the roles that you might have to share or offer. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, mm -hmm. um, for me as the mother, I felt like there was a, a war happening between the villain and I. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wouldn't even mm -hmm. look at me. Mm -hmm. And I was trying so hard to connect with him. I mean, yeah. mm -hmm. so. So you're hmm. speaking about connection, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when I was enrolled as the vulnerable one, um, and you're the mother, I really found you to be a smothering oh. mm. mother. Okay. Mm -hmm. I had this fierce instinct just to get away from you. Huh. And yeah. You know, I could see. <laughs> so I'm still feeling it a little bit, maybe. <laughs> no, I could see that. <laughs> I could see the smothering mother <laughs> emerging. Me, yeah. But I don't know. It, it was really important for me to connect with you. Hmm. And um, it, I don't know. And he just kept pushing me away yeah. and ignoring me. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So any thoughts from that place? So from the role of the villain, I yeah. think yeah, it just... I, it was hard to keep up with the intensity uh -huh. of the interaction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, for me, it was just, there was just too much going on. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, and I feel like that's, that's often how I feel when I'm in the room with JJB. Uh-huh, so that relates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and that makes sense, right? We're amplifying one role right now, mm -hmm. right, the villain, but we know there's so many others, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so mm -hmm. it makes sense, that intensity that you're speaking to, and also that it's really hard to hold that intensity, yeah. mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And as I reflect, I'm thinking yeah. about holding, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in the role of the space in between, yeah. uh, the vulnerable one, I was holding both the villain, right? Mm -hmm. And also being the smothering mother. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, and it was really uncomfortable yeah. you know, to be in that space. Yeah. And that space, as I understand it, is a space that holds a lot of empathy, mm -hmm. right? And all I wanted to do was run away from it. So this is an important insight, right? And you were really drawn to the space in between, yeah. right? And so really what we hope is that for us as therapists that the empathy comes in seeing what's revealed in this working through, right? And, and so the space in between vulnerable one is telling us something really important, which is I'm holding the villain mm -hmm. and I'm holding the mother, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the villain is, we see very guarded, right? There's a pr something being protected, right? Yeah. But we know that the villain also um, is in relationship to the abused one, the abandoned one, mm -hmm. the bullied one, mm -hmm. right? So it makes sense that there's a guardedness, that there's a protectiveness mm -hmm. there. And in fact, perhaps what's being protected is vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. Vulnerability looks like many things. Mm -hmm. And also, we have the mother who's saying like, I just wanna help you. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm trying to be here for you. Mm -hmm. and, and the villain is like, not even able to look, right? And so that's hard to tolerate mm -hmm. for the mother, which is also a vulnerability, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm reaching out, but I don't feel like it's being received, right? Mm -hmm. But if we think about what the villain may be experiencing, that level of care might actually be overwhelming, if not scary. Mm -hmm. Right, to, yeah. the, to the villain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It really makes me think about um, when I'm walking into the room, what am I holding? Mm. And then what is JJB holding? Right. And what's in that space in between? Mm. Indeed. So we're going to keep thinking about that. Mm. Everybody really shake out your bodies mm. for now and like actually really move around the space. And we're actually going to move <laughs> in the space over here to these chairs. <laughs> um, so find a chair. And I just want to continue this thread um, mm. thinking about... Oops. This arc, and I'm going to open it to everyone, right? Dominique directed this sculpt, but I want us to all, you know, make any connections that feel relevant to the work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to your experience. Yeah. I will say, um, <laughs> for me, as the smothering mother, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I, it, and in working with JJB, I, I can identify that, mm. especially when I work with clients, particularly younger clients. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> It was hard to think about that yeah. and hold that. So I hear you, right? From yeah. the place in me that can identify with the smothering mother, right? It is hard to hold that and to think about it. And also, it's so important because, as we saw, it has impact, right? Mm -hmm. That role. Mm -hmm. It makes me think of work. Um, uh, when we're trying to, like, de-escalate, mm -hmm. uh, a clinician is trying to de-escalate a, a, a challenging client, mm -hmm. at times we are, we're trained to tap the client mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. if they're yeah. unsuccessful mm -hmm. with de-escalating yeah. the situation. But there are times when the smothering mother may emerge in that clinician. Mm -hmm. They refuse to leave, 
and because they think they can fix the situation. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is a really great example mm -hmm. of when a role might emerge for us as the therapist in the room that even with all the good intention and all the care may actually supersede the needs of the client, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It makes me think that at times, you know, as therapists, you know, we, we're very open, very open, and we yes. hold <laughs> Yes, lot. that's true, yes. We end up holding a lot for our patients, but also for yes, ourselves. Yes, indeed. And that can be just too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting with the connection to how present the emotions were for me in mm -hmm. this process, right? Mm -hmm. um, and how we as drama therapists, mm -hmm. you know, we're embodied. We do a lot of embodied work. Mm -hmm. Indeed. And we hold that in our bodies. I mean, all clinicians do, don't mm -hmm. they, right? Absolutely. And. Um, as such, you know, I do this on a daily basis. And what does that do to me, like right. in terms of self-care and being thoughtful around that? Yeah. Um, and what does it do to Adam, mm -hmm. you know, and being thoughtful around that? Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. You know, I, I expected this to go deep. Mm -hmm. I just didn't expect it to go so fast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It just yeah. happened very quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm so glad you, you bring this up, and I want to invert process for you there. <laughs> and we know I love to invert yes, process. Yes, 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 <laughs> um, but I noticed that. I was aware that there was a lot coming up, right? Which is why I moved us into a reflection, because I wanted to continue that exploration and also give us some distance, right? So that we could mark what was happening, what was coming up, and that we're already starting to hear what some of those connections mm -hmm. are, right? And Carlos, you in particular, you were holding the role of the villain. Mm -hmm. And that's not an easy role to hold, mm -hmm. right? And as you just said, right, that as, as clinicians, at once we hold ourselves and our clients, mm -hmm. right? And, th and that can be quite a mm -hmm. lot. And, and, you know, in fact, with you all each stepping into the interplay of these roles, you're meeting yourself in action um, and your experience of another. Mm -hmm. And there's something about stepping into our experience in an embodied way of the work, right, that can activate and reveal so much. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and truthfully, these feelings, experiences, perceptions, assumptions, mm -hmm. they're there in our body, whether mm -hmm. we speak to them, move with and through them or not, and they do impact our work, mm -hmm. which is why it's so important for us to look at this and to mm -hmm. think about it and talk about it. And there's something about moving it into action mm -hmm. that, that actually can reveal things we might not otherwise see. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I'm thinking, Dominique, that in that moment when you stepped into the vulnerable one, there was a shift for mm -hmm. you. You did shift it a bit. Yeah. Do you, do you want to speak to that? Absolutely. So um, being in the role of the vulnerable one, it was, it was kind of hard. Mm -hmm. um, I felt invisible in that moment. Mm. I felt like I wasn't being heard. Mm -hmm. I wasn't being seen. And um, although mother wanted to help mm -hmm. me in the role of the vulnerable one, mm -hmm. I didn't feel helped. Right. And I felt like uh, it was almost as if I wanted to scream mm -hmm. it out. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, that's, that was the reason for that shift. Yes, so it's so interesting, right? Because you really leaned in in that space in between to mm -hmm. perhaps what JJB as the villain mm -hmm. might be experiencing, right? But interestingly, that invisibility is also what we heard represented and mm -hmm. reflected from mm -hmm. the role of the mother, mm -hmm. right? This idea that I, I'm not even being looked at, right. I, I feel like I'm putting myself out there and I'm not being seen, mm -hmm. right? So even in that, we're hearing a shared space mm -hmm. in what both are expressing. I'm not feeling understood. I'm not feeling seen. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, that peace that's so hard, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that perhaps in that feeling that way, there's a missing of each other. Mm -hmm. um, any other thoughts before we move? Um, I actually wasn't expecting this to be so deep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, for me, it was like a shock. Yeah. And I'm still holding so much emotion mm -hmm. surrounding this. Um, but it's definitely going to impact the way that I encounter my work with JJB. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but not only with JJB, with other clients mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I just want to say thank you for stepping into this with mm -hmm. me. Um, at the moment, I couldn't articulate what I was feeling. So yeah. being able to sit back and hear the reflections yes. was so valuable Indeed. and important to me. Mm -hmm. So thank you for pulling me out mm -hmm. so, so I could hear the reflections. Yeah. And you know, that really speaks to the RAP, right, as a mm -hmm. supervision tool mm -hmm. for uh, drama therapists, mm -hmm. or for our drama therapy mm -hmm. toolbox. And, you know, we co created uh, JJB um, from our own experiences, our own clients, our own practices, right? And then from that, we came up with this, and it's just so impactful and so informative in terms of the work that we do, um, whether it be at a hospital or at a school, wherever we work. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's really neat. And something else that occurred to me, right? Mm. Um, 
while we were sitting here, and I think it's actually quite lovely, is JJB has been with us this entire time. Indeed. Mm -hmm. He's been right here. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of nice. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, really, I really like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that part, yeah. Indeed. Yeah. JJB has been present with mm -hmm. us throughout, right? And in that way, um, a witness mm -hmm. yeah. to our work. Mm -hmm. Right, and much has happened in this exploration um, already, right? And just even, even to mark that for ourself, ourselves, two things that I'm thinking about. One, we often get to witness as therapists, our clients do deep work, right? They don't get to witness us in deep process and work, and JJB held that space mm -hmm. for us today, mm -hmm. right? That space of working through what our experience of being in relationship mm -hmm. to the other in this process, right? Mm -hmm. And so JJB was able to see that process of working through for you all, um, and also that there's something to the fact that you all really stepped in to JJB, right? And, and in your experience of JJB, and in doing that so much, got revealed mm -hmm. in that exploration, right? Mm -hmm. Because what really happened in moving this into dramatic action, really you were tapping into and giving shape to internal relational experience. And in giving shape to that, right, that is inherently a feeling space that's being embodied, that internal relational experience. And so it makes sense what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of feeling, a lot still percolating. And I, so I wanna give space to that mm. so that we can really spend some time working with that. Um, so my thought is this, that will take a bit of time, maybe 10, 15 minutes, <clears throat> and I would like to invite you all to, in thinking about how and where mm. you held JJB mm. in this process, in this arc thus far, what is the poem, the story, the journal entry, the song, whatever it is for you that needs to be shared, that needs to have voice right mm -hmm. now? And you can move about the room wherever you want to go, and we'll take a good a, a amount of time, however much time you all need to do that. And then we'll come back and we'll see where we go. Yeah? Mm -hmm. OK. Love is a Hawaiian tidal wave that smothers the beach sands on a moonlit night. Once upon night. a time, there was a young Empty man. words and expectations. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from anyone. So after about 10 to 15 minutes, the group came back, and the therapists were invited to share their individual pieces. It was very clear that there were connections across what everyone had written. And so what we did was we took the verbatim text from each individual piece and we created a co-created piece. And in that working through, we actually developed a play. And we moved that play into dramatic action. And part of that process, which was of course informed from the embodied learnings from the earlier sculpt, there was an ability to take that process into a playing with and working through, a playing with and working through as they continue to work with this play. And in so doing, the therapists were able to find a way to hold contradictory narratives that were coming up in the work. And in that, space was made for them to hold the space for the things as they are and as they hope for it to be in the work. From a role theory perspective, we think about health for the client as the ability to live within the, con the, within the, uh, the, within the context of dissonant roles, right? And so if that's health for the client, then for the therapist, it's the ability to find balance while holding dissonant narratives in the work. And it's in this process that we're about to share with you now that the therapists were able to do that. Once upon a time, there was a young person, often judged and ridiculed. They were misunderstood. They remained forever in exile from the construct of humanity. They were perceived as a joke and henceforth became known as a joker. Leave me alone. I don't need anything from anyone. Am I supposed to talk to you just because? You stand there looking at me like I need fixing because I am here. What can you give me? Everything has been taken away from me. I got nothing to give you. You don't know me. Complex, wounded, masterful at mass that hide a frown that on the outside. That frown is worn upside down. Love is a Hawaiian tidal wave that smothers the beach sands on a moonlit night. It is a bar tightening a chest on a roller coaster cart. It is a tightly held dress on prom night. 
It is Japanese wasabi, Mexican jalapeno peppers, and Jamaican scotch bonnet opening up an ignorant tongue. It is an adult balancing a child tricycle. Empty words and expectations fill the room and squeeze me into invisibility. You stare at me with your eyes filled with curiosity and what you think is the perfect formula, the perfect solution, as if I'm a math equation. You try to add, divide, multiply, and subtract, and still end up short. I have been stripped of everything I had. I got nothing to offer you. I am emptied and depleted. Where do I go from this exile? Leave me alone. I don't need anything from anyone. The Joker had a mate that held them close and quite dear. As they moved through the world, united and disconnected, the phenomenon of frustration, well, it became a sensation. For the frustrated one had arrived at a space where connecting with the Joker, it was beginning to leave its trace. Love loves you like an abusive mother who wakes you, wakes you up for school, gives me nothing for breakfast, forgot to pick me up because she's drunk, told me to cook after I walked home from school and needing to do my homework, and then smothering me, holding me, opening me up in ways I don't feel comfortable or like. I am comforted. That's the love I know. In this moment, as we sit in stillness, and the only thing that's heard is the rise and fall of my breath. There is no searching, no wandering, and for the first time, you see me. You really see me. And I see you. And there is a mutual respect and understanding. And I am left with my words. Wow. Let's really breathe that in, that beautiful and powerful work. Take a deep breath. And let's come back over here together, really. I just have to reflect back that each time you all do this, the heartbeat of it shifts in a way that drops in a little bit deeper each time, and it's just beautiful to watch that arc. So I thought today that perhaps we could end where we began, and that's with JJB. So I'm gonna move JJB here so that we can see JJB and JJB can see us. Mm -hmm. And you all have really, in this work together, mm -hmm. taken JJB in. Mm -hmm. And so from that place of embodied knowing, embodied understanding, what do you wanna say? to JJB, what would you like for him to hear? I'm heavy, but pulled. Hmm. Um, the importance of space, mm -hmm. um, protection <coughs> from a distance. Mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. I see you. I see you because in many ways I used to be you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the gift that you have given to me, to us. Mm -hmm. And thank you for, um, for reminding me of all the multitude of layers and roles that you are. Indeed. So I have to ask, what's being expressed? What's being shared here with JJB? Love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, there's um, 
a drama therapy article. Um, it's called Performance as Arts-Based Research in Drama Therapy Supervision. And one of the things it speaks to is the intimacy that happens mm -hmm. when we step into the role, the experience of another. Mm -hmm. In that meeting space, mm -hmm. right, which is intimate, which is close, right? Um, the article says that that's where we find the quote, royal road mm -hmm. to love. Mm -hmm. And that's the road that you all have traveled mm -hmm. in this work. Um, and how powerful and important, especially when we think about what's been identified, right, which is that Perhaps JJB, right now at least, can experience that, feel that intensity of love and care in the room. Mm -hmm. So then it becomes ever more important that you all are able to express that here mm -hmm. in this space so that that can have voice. Mm -hmm. What a journey we have journeyed <laughs> together. <laughs> right? And, uh, you know, I have to say, you know, Dominique, this all started from the sculpt that you brought into the space, mm -hmm. right? And so I just wanna ask you, as we're thinking about this work, this arc, this journey on the royal road to love, what travels with you? Mm. Um, so I continue to think about the space in between. Mm -hmm. That's something that I was drawn to from the beginning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and it sits with me mm -hmm. and thinking that we are not much different than JJB. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. also to think about what challenged me in the beginning is what I really needed to explore. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. right. so that's an important one, right? Mm -hmm. Especially for us as therapists, right? Oftentimes that thing that we want to push away mm -hmm. is the very thing we mm -hmm. need to be bringing mm -hmm. closer and looking at, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Well, it is time to wrap up. Um, but I just want to say to all of you all, what beautiful, powerful, deep work. I appreciate all that you all have brought to this individually and also collectively. Mm -hmm. mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So over the last few weeks, we've been working towards building our embodied case narratives. Um, and last week, we spent a bit of time working on the embodied case narrative of your client, Chantal, mm -hmm. of Checkers. Mm -hmm. So I thought, thought this week we would spend some time working on the case narrative of your client, Gwen. Great. All right. So what we'll do is we'll start by having you bring Gwen into the space through a nonverbal case presentation, and then we'll give voice to her a little bit later. Chantal and I will sit over there and we'll witness and we'll provide some reflections afterwards. Okay. All right. So why don't you go ahead and set up the space and then we can get started and we can meet Gwen. Um, Dana, does it have to be like an exact replica of the space? Uh, no. During this process, we're going to move in and out of dramatic reality. <laughs> and so it can be the exact space, but it, you may consider this a space where this could happen. Okay. Does that feel good? The distance of the chairs? Yeah, it might shift, but I think for it's a good place to start. Okay, so before we begin and meet Gwen, I wonder if we can set an intention or ask a question. And this question is gonna be the one that guides us through this process and keeps us on task. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you think about Gwen and this relationship, what is it that you're curious and interested in finding? Yeah, I think I'm most curious about the fact that this relationship terminated like eight months ago and mm. she's continued to really stay with me. I'm also thinking about the roles that I brought into the space in our relationship and also the roles that I believe I was cast into by her in our relationship. Okay, and if you were to listen deeper to yourself, is there another question? <laughs> yeah, I think I'm also thinking about um, the role my forming clinical identity had in this. So you know, all that goes into that, uh, am I doing it right? Was it good enough? <laughs> Is it okay? Sure. Yeah. So I'm just gonna share back with you what I'm hearing so I make sure I have it, okay. and then also make sure we all understand where we're going, all yeah. right? So you have a curiosity around why this client continues to live with you despite having terminated eight months ago. Mm -hmm. You're curious about the roles you brought into the relationship and the roles that you were cast into. And on top of all of that is this question of your forming clinical identity. Mm -hmm. Who am I? Am I doing it right? 
Yeah, is that like a lot for one? I mean, we'll find out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you know, what we know to be true is that these questions will shift in form as you move in and out of role. Okay. All right? But for now, let's meet Gwen. Great. So Gwen, I'm going to ask you to pause for a moment, and if you don't mind joining me downstage. And Chantal, I'll ask that you come and join me up here to meet and mirror Gwen. Go ahead and come a little closer. And from this place of embodied empathy, Chantal, can you share a little bit with us of what it feels like to be Gwen? Um, fear, discomfort, um, like I don't want to be seen, um, protection, like this is my, like my protection. And where in your body are you feeling that? Um, it's like here. Your so abdomen? Yeah, okay. my abdomen, yeah. Excellent, go ahead and let that roll go. And Rachel, I'll ask you to step outside roll just for a moment. And I'd like us to go ahead and bring Gwen in again. And this time we can give voice to Gwen. Okay. So we can imagine that Gwen's seeing you for the first time in this space. Mm -hmm. And just for context, where are we? <laughs> yeah, so this is actually like a group setting. So there would be chairs all around the table and clients in all the other okay. seats. And where are you seated? I'm in that chair closest to you right there. You know, I could tell you were sitting there because of the playful way she was looking at you. I'm so curious though, how old is she? Excellent. Curiosities. I don't get to answer, huh? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> you know, these curiosities are great, and I want us to use them to role train. So integrate the curiosities that connect to you and Gwen, and let go of the ones that don't. Because okay. after all, the curiosities are coming up for a reason. Yeah. They're coming up because we are seeing and feeling in relationship to this embodiment. We're seeing and feeling in relationship to this client, and that is embodied understanding. All right, okay. so when you're ready, let's meet Gwen again. Here you go. Excellent. Rachel, let's have you come back in. And Chantal, you can join us up here. <laughs> and Chantal, what was it like witnessing Gwen enter space? <laughs> um, it seemed like she was a little anxious and nervous. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like she was trying to get a sense of the room. Yeah. Um, she looked like she was left behind. Mm -hmm. um, and then she connected with you, Rachel. She looked playful. Um, she ignored everyone else around her. Mm. Um, yeah, know, that's all I see. Yeah, yeah. it's interesting because uh, for me, the moment that looked like you guys made eye contact, it seemed like everything else disappeared. Mm. And although this is probably just like a few seconds or moments, it seemed like everyone disappeared and it was just focused on the two of you. Mm. Can you connect any of this to the way in which you know Gwen? Yeah, I definitely feel like in that moment we really honed in on each other. I'm also, you know, that the anxiety, I think, um, I think she, she came in with the group already in progress and I think there was this sort of fear of being, you know, left mm -hmm, behind. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that anxiety was definitely there as well. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It also, like, when she came in, she, she sat down to me kind of heavy. Mm. Like, um, like, it was like the first time she was sitting down and then somehow when she connected with you, I, I noticed she kind of landed, you mm. know, with the the writing and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, so that connection kind of brought them yeah, together. Kind of exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, you know, you're already <laughs> taking on the role <laughs> of Gwen. So I'm wondering, Rachel, yeah. would it be useful for you to see Chantal enter as Gwen? Yeah, Chantal, if you don't mind, that would be. I don't mind. You'll let me know if I'm not getting it right. <laughs> like, if I don't <laughs> she do something will. right. Yeah, but Dana, on that, yeah. 
I'm just, in our process before, you've mentioned the difference between faithfully rendering versus not, and I'm aware that I've brought this person into space twice now, and I'm now inviting Chantal to do that based on what I've done, and so I was just hoping you could clarify the difference between faithfully rendering and, you know, not. Yeah, I can try. Okay. Um, so with this process of embodied supervision, the way that I think about it is that it's the difference between mocking and miming. And mock mm. in itself is a superficial imitation. Whereas miming, we're setting this intention and bringing this individual in multiple times. Mm. We're not just accepting the first introduction. We're taking this time to inform and to role train. You know, in drama therapy, we talk a lot about empathy and the notion of empathy being the therapist stepping into the shoe of the client. Mm -hmm. In this embodied process, we're stepping in, tying the shoes, and walking around. Nice. We're living in yes. this mm -hmm. individual, That's right? Great. We're moving them through our bodies. Mm -hmm. And with that, deepening our practice, deepening our ethics, mm -hmm. it's kind of our responsibility that when these individuals live with us, that we move them through us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that help a little bit? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So let's go ahead and we'll see you, Chantal, bring in Rachel's version of Gwen. All right. Here you go. Excellent. Chantal, let's have you come back in. Rachel, what was it like seeing Gwen? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's nice to see her because this is obviously someone I remember really fondly. Um, but I'm also realizing now in watching this, I think it was really hard for her to stay in the room. And I actually think that, that was, we touched on this a, a minute ago that it was anxiety provoking. But I'm realizing now watching Chantal, I think she stayed in the space truly as long as she could, and it was not easy. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, I felt like for me, it was, um, as Gwen, it was hard to hold this position. Um, it, I just felt like tightness, you know, mm. again, in this area, and I felt very insecure. I didn't want to be seen. Mm. Um, I didn't feel pretty, mm. yeah. As Gwen, I didn't feel pretty. Mm -hmm. um, I also felt very disconnected from the space in the beginning, and I wasn't sure what was going on. Um, I don't feel pretty. Um, and then I, I felt like more connected when I, when I saw you mm -hmm. and yeah. when we connected. You know. Does that connect at all to the way you know Gwen? Yeah, I mean, it all does, but especially the stuff around the beauty. Um, a lot of our conversation centered around beauty and aesthetics, you know, something as light as, when I get out of here, we should go get our hair dyed together. Or as serious as, you know, my sister's beautiful and I'm not. And so her life was like this and mine was like this. And just a lot around the importance of beauty and her perceived absence of it in her mm -hmm. own experience was mm -hmm. really significant. Yeah, you know, and it would be lost on me if I didn't mention that when you entered Chantal, you chose a different chair. Yeah. Right, you sat closer. Yeah. And I'm thinking about when we were reflecting mm -hmm. earlier about this desire, that moment yeah. where everybody else disappeared mm -hmm. and you moved closer together. Mm -hmm. And that felt like a really beautiful, spontaneous yeah. moment that I was not anticipating, mm -hmm. right? And so it was beautiful to see that, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm wondering, Rachel, if it would be useful for you mm -hmm. to share a little bit more information about Gwen, because sure. I know that you've got some <laughs> curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do, of course, you, you know, selfishly, I want to know how old she is, yeah. it's particularly because of how she felt when I was holding her in my, in my body, her yeah. posture. Yeah. So the age is actually really interesting because before I met her, I clocked her as being maybe in her 60s. Um, and then when I met her, I found out she's actually in her late 40s. Mm. She is a white, mm. heterosexual, cisgendered woman. Um, she it lives with her mother, but it's not really a great situation. She's never felt entirely safe there. It can be kind of tumultuous. She's a total hopeless romantic, like fairy tale stuff, really wants a prince to swoop in and like take her out of that. She longs to be in the role of mother herself. Mm -hmm. um, she's so funny. I mean, just like so, so funny. She's an, really an artist. She's a great singer. Um, 
I'm not really wanting to bring her diagnosis into this. No, and you don't have to. That's not what it's about. Um, but what we know to be true is the way in which you're sharing some of Gwen's role system to us, it's very clear that you care a lot about this individual. And I would venture to guess that she found you important as well, right? Yeah, I don't want to know her diagnosis. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. so, so usually, um, so a curiosity I have, right, is, you know, what was she handing you? Um, so <laughs> the, um, the intervention was to draw masks, and Gwen actually turned that paper over and rather uh, scribed the lyrics to the chorus of My Humps by the Black Eyed Peas. <gasps> yes. She's so playful. <laughs> She's so playful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Was, yeah, me too. <laughs> so <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. So uh, one of the things that can be usually can be useful in this process is us taking some time to play out your therapist role. Yeah. But since we're already in this place of play, I wonder if it would be useful for the two of you to engage in a dramatic enactment. Mm -hmm. And we can have you, Chantal, enter as Gwen again. And Rachel, you can play your therapist self. And I'll remember to sit. Try to remember to sit. I mean, year. let's let Gwen sit. decide. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Excellent. Come on back in, Chantal, and Rachel, come stand over <laughs> here. What was that like? Um, so, I clearly remember this person very fondly, and I've spoken to that. But I think because of that, I sort of have like rose-colored glasses over the relationship, because I was remembering through that uh, embodiment that I was actually initially kind of uncomfortable, like the eye contact really <laughs> took me off guard at first, and then I became charmed by her and realized she's so playful, as mm. we've said. But at first I was like, oh, I don't... <laughs> um, so that came back to me yeah. in this moment. I could tell I was freaking you out. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, was, uh, as Gwen. As Gwen, no, as Gwen, I could <laughs> tell when I was looking at you. I felt like I just wanted you to understand me. Yeah. Um, and then when you met my eyes, um, I don't know, when you met my eyes, you, you met me as Gwen. Mm. And it, it took my breath away, mm. yeah. Wow, that's really powerful, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that can be useful when we're engaging in this process is to move to a space of embodied reflexivity, mm -hmm. right? And the way in which we can do that is we can bring in some metaphor or an image to think about this relationship a little bit more. And the reason we use metaphors is it gives us another language to speak about this relationship. Okay. And so I'm wondering, when you think about your relationship with Gwen, what is the image that exists between the two of you? And now this image can be likened to the obstacle role or a barrier, but just a reminder that obstacles don't have to be negative things, right? So mm -hmm. when you think about this relationship, what's the image? I think it's a mirror. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the mirror a little bit? Is it a single way mirror? Is it two ways? Uh, it ha I think it has like multiple functions, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes it functions as a two-way mirror, but on either side. So we could both see through it and see each other. And then I think other times it functions as like a magic mirror. So you can see into it, but instead of just seeing yourself, you see a fantasy version of yourself. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking so much about something she said to me all the time, which was, you know, if I looked like you, the world would be blank. If I looked mm -hmm. like you, this would have happened. Um, and so I think for her, what she sees in this mirror is like this version of the world that could have been if she looked differently. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for me, what I am seeing in this magic mirror is a clinician who is confident and knows what they're doing and knows that it's okay and good and yeah. fine. Even That's would be good. <laughs> beautiful image. <laughs> yes, so good. So when we think about this mirror that exists between the two of you, yeah. what are some of the roles that you're bringing into the room, the guide roles you're bringing in, as well as the roles she's casting you in? Because that was yeah. one of the curiosities you had at the beginning. Right. 
So I think the roles I'm bringing into the room or trying to bring in the room are sister, friend, confidant. Um, I think the role I'm being cast into is the beauty, um, more specifically like the Barbie or like the beauty queen, like Miss America. Okay, and what's it like for you to play that role? <laughs> so there's two parts of it. You know, there's the Gorgeous. obvious, <laughs> it's like, thank you, wow. <laughs> but then there's the other part of it where it's like, that does not, that's not the role I'm trying to play in this relationship at all. Yeah. And most importantly, I don't think that role is serving to Gwen at all. Okay. So if we think about shifting the question a little bit around these roles, we're exploring the sub role. We're trying to find the sub roles to the Barbie doll, mm -hmm. right? That sub role that might work in service in yeah. your relationship with Gwen. Right. Okay. Um, and you know, one of the ways in which we be can begin to unfold this a little bit more is to introduce another art medium into the space, right? And so I know that that can take the form of painting or letter writing, and I know you've been writing some letters, right? And these letters that we're often writing are fantasy letters. Mm -hmm. They're the letters that we write, but we don't intend to send, right? Let's go ahead and we can join each other up here. And the reason why letter writing can be really important in this process is that it gives us the opportunity to practice the skills of therapist role responsiveness and therapist congruence, right? And what that essentially means is it gives us the opportunity to practice out sharing to the client how they are impacting us, mm -hmm. which is a high level of intimacy in a therapeutic relationship. Mm -hmm. And because we're not sending it, there are no wrong answers, right? And so you can put that out there and to try this on. Yeah. Um, and so I wonder if you could share a little bit of a letter to us. Sure. Dear Hero, thank you for all that you taught me. Thank you for singing with me and for the joy you brought into my life. I'm sorry the world has been so unfair. I hope you found your prince and that you feel loved and safe. I hope whatever mirror you're looking into nowadays shows you your true beauty. With love, your guide. Mm. What's it like sharing that letter with us? Feels tender, you know, not quite like vulnerable, but tender. It's just really, it's really nice to imagine her doing well mm. and being happy. You know, that mentalizing is so important for our clients, being able to hold them in mind in this way that, yes, they're doing well. Um, I know for me, I feel comfort knowing that there's at least one person in the world who might be thinking of me mm. and holding me in mind. Yeah. And I feel like in many ways, um, she might feel you thinking about her. I think that we do feel mm -hmm. when someone is really fondly or loving us thinking mm -hmm. about them too. And what was uh, it like for you, Chantal, hearing about the letter? Well, for me, well, f for me, it, it, uh, I would say that when you were in training, when um, you met Gwen, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I felt you could see that she taught you a lot then, and she's still, she's like, she's still teaching you yeah. right now. Yeah, these are the gifts that continue, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. As it's we continue beautiful. to unpack mm -hmm. and learn about who we are as clinicians, which is ultimately <laughs> the journey you're on. Yeah. Right. And part of the reason we're doing all of this is because it's to build towards our embodied case mm -hmm. narrative. Um, Twyla Tharp, a prolific choreographer and dancer, um, before creating any performance piece, engages in a process that she calls scratching, where she gathers up images and quotes and music and artifacts, and she sits with all of these objects, and from these objects, she creates. And that's a little bit of what we're doing in this process. We're using the clinical case history that we have. We're using our embodiments, our letter writing, our art processing, the relationships that we're forming here. All of this to inform this embodied case narrative, which mm -hmm. is essentially a performance of the therapeutic relationship, right, from multiple levels of knowing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know that you've been working on one, and I know that they can take on the form of a performance or a music or a dance. And I know you two have been collaborating on forming this one of Gwen. And I wonder if you could share a little bit of that with us this evening. Sure. Excellent. I can take your book. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think about Gwen often. Recently, I was considering why it is that she stuck with me the way that she has. 
I think perhaps it's because she is the first client who took my breath away. Or maybe it's because despite being very different on the surface, we had so many shared needs and shared experiences. The first time I met Gwen, she came into a group I was facilitating about halfway through. She immediately began drawing and she appeared to be trying to accomplish the task at hand as quickly as possible. Relatively soon, she began making faces at me and trying to lock my eyes. Initially, I was taken aback, but I quickly became charmed by her and began mirroring her facial expressions and movements back to her. She seemed satisfied by this clinical choice on my part and began signing numbers to me and nodding emphatically. Clearly, we were communicating in some sort of code that I had deemed myself worthy of receiving. I hadn't cracked the code yet, but I wanted to. Then she handed me what she had been working on and quickly ran from the room. I looked down to discover that while the rest of the group had been drawing masks, Gwen had been writing the lyrics to my humps. <laughs> the next few times I saw Gwen, all we did was mirror facial expressions and movements back to one another. There was no speaking. But clearly we were meeting each other and communicating in a co-created manner. I think back now on this tricky mirror that seemed to form between us. The smear that Gwen so desperately wanted to see herself in. A different version of herself that she wanted me to see her in as well. The smear that I, a new clinician, wanted badly to discover my clinical identity in. We both wanted to be seen by one another and to find ourselves as a result. Sometimes this mirror would allow us to see ourselves, or rather, an idealized fantasy version of ourselves. But other times we could see through it and really see and witness each other. The first time Gwen spoke to me, she told me about this building with a magical room inside of it, and when you went into it, you could transform into anything you wanted. I asked her what would happen if I went into it, and she said, You can be anything you want to be. I asked her what would happen if she went into it, or rather, if she'd ever been, and she said, It wouldn't work for me and my mother, but it would work for you and or my sister. I asked her why it would work for me, but not for her, and she explained that if she were me, more specifically, if she looked like me, the world would be different. If I looked like you. The trauma that had been done to her body would not have occurred. If I looked like you. She would have been deemed worthy of protecting and keeping safe. If I looked like you. The world would have been kind. I would not have been hurt if she looked like me. In this moment, our tricky mirror was showing Gwen a hopeful version of the world that could have been if she looked like me. And that same mirror was reflecting back to me all of the trauma my own body had experienced. It was, however, not my turn or my time to share that with Gwen. She did not need me to take this hopeful version of the world away from her. Instead, I waited for this mirror to recalibrate, as it always did, until I could see her again. When it was time to go, Gwen told me that she loved me. <coughs> I did not have time to reply. She ran away too quickly. But at this point, I'm sure it goes without saying, I loved her too. Wow. <laughs> that was beautiful. Beautiful work. Thank Thanks. you so much, both of you, for sharing that. Um, I'm wondering, first, Rachel, from you, what mm -hmm. was it like to share your embodied case narrative or part of it this evening? Yeah, I, I'm feeling very full thinking about one of the 98 questions I asked you at the <laughs> beginning and the one about, you know, my <laughs> clinical identity specifically. <laughs> And just, you know, that it was enough because it was our relationship and so it was enough and to just trust the relationship. Um, yeah, you'll find yeah. it together. Yeah. yeah, exactly. If you just open yourself up to it. That's right. Yeah. And Chantal, I wonder if you can share a little bit from the role of Gwen mm. and also from yourself as another drama therapist. I'd say as um, Gwen, I felt heard. Um, mm. I felt safe. Um, I felt like a dreamer. 
mm. you know. Um, and I felt like there was someone out there that I could talk to. Mm. I think as a, the therapist, a drama therapist, <laughs> um, it was so beautiful to see another therapist taking care of a client in such a way, mm. being able to allow themselves to feel, um, to even love, mm. um, and just to hold. Yeah. Mm. We're sometimes so hesitant to use the L word, yeah. right, yeah. when it comes to the clients, mm -hmm. to our clients, to mm -hmm. these individuals in our care who clearly take up space in our lives in these beautiful ways. Mm -hmm. But yes, love is here, and it has been on this stage the whole evening, mm -hmm. right? And so I'm curious, and it's part of why we do this, is it's to develop our clinical role repertoire, yeah. right? So thinking about the roles we can integrate from this experience and place into our mm -hmm. clinical role system. So I'm wondering, Rachel and Chantal, mm -hmm. for you both, what might be a role you're, you're going to integrate or how might this inform your clinical practice? And Chantal, I'll ask you to start with that. Um, I think what's coming up more for me is the role of like the container, um, holding all of her experiences and holding her body mm -hmm. uh, gave me so much information and I think, I wouldn't say sifter, but something about being able to just read all of, and, you know, and feel all of what I've been mm. feeling to sift all that. But I, I feel the role of container mostly. I love this image of the sifter, yeah. right? Um, or like a filter in some capacity. Because ultimately that's what we're aiming for in relationship, right? Is I want to take it into my body, sift through it, filter it a little bit, and hand back some manageable dose, mm. right? being able to take it in, because we can't hold it all. No. We talk a lot about containing, but it, we cannot just hold. Mm -hmm. We're not dumpsters, mm -hmm. we're not receptacles. Mm -hmm. We need to take it in, figure out what we need from it. It's like wine tasting, mm -hmm. right? Get the flavors on your tongue and then spit it out. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> ah, God. What about for you? I what think, are the um, roles coming up for you? In, um, in thinking about leaning into and on and just really trusting the relationship, um, I think I'm coming away with the role of the listener mm. and just remembering that if you are really listening, the answer is always there because it's, it's co-created. Mm. You know, it's, it's together. Mm. Yeah. So if you're able to hear it, you know, you'll have the answer. Right, and it, it's a different form of listening. It's not listening to react or respond, it's listening to understand. Mm. And it's not just listening to the words that are coming from the client, but the way in which they're impacting and we're feeling them in our bodies, right? To be able to hold that whole image mm. of the individual across from us and the relationship that's forming. Mm -hmm. Thank you mm. both so very much. This is beautiful work and I'm inspired by this. Um, and I look forward to continuing this process. Um, thank you. Welcome back. So we're going to start just by introducing ourselves uh, and our role. Ooh. And welcome to speak to any role that, you're, that you carry with you in life, um, just to bring us into, <laughs> into this space together. So again, I'm Nisha Sachnani, director of the program in drama therapy. Hi, I'm Sarah McMullen. Oh, oh God, it's just I've got <laughs> so many mics. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's in your alma. I am so, a mic holder. I'm Sarah McMullen. I'm on the faculty of um, NYU Drama Therapy Program, mm -hmm. and I was a presenter. Indeed. Uh, I'm Britton. I'm also a faculty in the program in Drama Therapy, and I was the facilitator for the RAP. Woo! Woo! <laughs> hey, good evening. My name's Adam Stevens, and I was a process actor in the RAP presentation tonight. Mm -hmm. I'm Carlos Rodriguez, and uh, also an actor at the ARA. Mm -hmm. I'm Dominique Darrell, also an actor in the ARA. Mm -hmm. I'm Dana. I'm also a faculty member and a drama therapist, part of the Embodied Case Narrative. Uh, I'm Rachel Bolter, and I was an actor in the Embodied Case Narrative. Mm -hmm. I'm Chantal George, and I'm a drama therapist, as you know. You are the lead of the class. Are you sure, Chantal? Yes, you are. 
Hi, I'm Idalmis Garcia. I'm a first uh, year student of drama therapy. Nice. And my name is Alessia Hughes, and I'm a second year student in the drama therapy program. All right. And because we felt that rising up in the audience, can we give them all a great big round of applause? <laughs> Right, so we have time just for a, um, a few questions, comments, observations about what we saw here this evening. Um, it's a really unique opportunity to take a process that typically takes place in private space in a public sphere. So we have a chance to see group supervision and then supervision in a dyad using drama therapy techniques, specifically drawn from role theory and method. And we're gonna just start over with you, Alessia. Comment, observation, question, take it away. Yes. Um, well, before I start, I just wanna say that at the beginning, Ida had turned to me and said, the room feels really tender tonight. Mm -hmm. And I wanna thank all of the people on this stage for continuing to show that tenderness through their, as Dana said at the end, the, the love that was mm -hmm. shown um, on stage tonight. So I just want to thank all of you before I begin mm. to comment. Mm. Yes, we could clap. That's nice. <laughs> um, and so I was thinking a lot, in, and in Sarah's beautiful opening speech, she speaks about how role method af af affords us this way of looking at clients and in, in this like multi, um, with, with, with multiple pieces of the client and they're not just one thing and this, this dynamic changing person. And what struck me tonight and watching you all is that within supervision, but embodied supervision, how those different roles and constituents of the client become more rounded and full through embodiment. So I'm thinking about, um, in the case of JJB, like there were three roles that came up and especially I'm thinking of the role of the mother. Yes. It wasn't just the mother, it was the smothering yes. mother. And th that, yeah. that quality emerged through the embodiment. That's right. yeah. And in the same ways that we met Gwen in that role training over and over, there was a new piece of her that was added each time um, that I don't think would have emerged just in a, in a talking space. And so that struck me tonight. Mm -hmm. Would anyone like to comment on that? On what's revealed through the process of embodying and enrolling and repeating that process mm -hmm. so that these nuances come through. I guess I would like to comment on it. <laughs> Just comment on it. <laughs> you may. Because I keep Do talking. that. We're doing each other. Just to say that I think sometimes when we think about theater techniques and we think about improvisation, sometimes the, the, um, I think the misconception can be, oh, that will take too long or it's too complicated. Mm -hmm. Um, and what is reaffirmed for me in watching you this evening is actually how quickly yeah. um, all yes. that remains with us is yes. revealed mm -hmm. when you just give it a space. Well, so, so how does she live with you, this mm -hmm. person who you're with, who you're in relationship with, who you are um, working to care for, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. uh, what is revealed if you just give that some space? And we saw clearly mm -hmm. just how much is revealed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? yeah. yeah, well, and I think a, a lot of the the supervisees that have worked with me, I prefer that they show me than tell me. Mm -hmm. So when they start to talk about a case in my office, I ask them to actually enter mm -hmm. and land in the room mm -hmm. as the individual we're going to speak about. Because mm -hmm. um, it just gives me so much more information. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, it, it puts me into the room that I actually can't be in when they're delivering care. Yes. And so it allows me to get an understanding of how they're taking these individuals in and how they're meeting them. Mm -hmm. So I also just want to. Oh, I'm sorry. No, go. I just want to pick up on what you said, Alessia. That in fact it is in the embodied space where things get revealed, right? And you're exactly right. The smothering mother was absolutely revealed in the action of the work, and that becomes important because we can use our words to hide the very things that we don't want to see. Um, where when we move into an embodied space, when we bring something into action, it's a lot harder to hide those things because what actually what we saw happen was it was, it was in the space. Mm -hmm. It was in the space and our bodies know these things, but our words can hide them where the body can't. And because we do this work in action with our clients, it becomes actually very important that we do this work in action with ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Because, you know, as we talk to in our process, these things actually do come out in the interaction with patients, whether we speak to it, move with it and through it or not. And so you're, I just wanted to amplify that piece that you said because it is so important. Yeah, yeah. yeah and just kind of to uh, talk on, on that direction, we had talked about this before, that we, we've worked so hard to um, 
to see people, the clients, as we're getting to know them. Yeah. And then we walk in as therapists and we hold these very clinical path pathology-based mm -hmm. roles. Mm -hmm. And we always say, be your authentic self, mm -hmm. be your authentic self. Well, what does that actually mean? Mm -hmm. um, and so we need to now do yeah. our own role training mm -hmm. so that when we walk into the room, we are really building that authentic self using all these multiple ways of learning how it feels and what it looks like and not just mm -hmm. to use this uh, language that can really distance us mm -hmm. from the work and put us back into what I call very pathology-based and defended stance. Yeah. Authentic self and authentic partnership, Yeah, yeah. relationship. Um, Idalmis, would, do you have an observation or a comment or a question you'd like to Yeah, ask? I'm, I'm here sitting with a lot. <laughs> and mm -hmm. What I can, um, if something is resonating with me, something that you said, and the, being the container and the listener, mm -hmm. and how being both and finding that space in between mm -hmm. the both, how do you listen beyond words? How yeah. do you listen with your, with your body? Yes. And how do you meet that client in mm -hmm. where they are? Like, you meet JJB where they are, you mm -hmm. meet when they're where they are. I think something I found completely like outstanding and beautiful, it was, First, the word love that you both use, in, and I think it was absolutely like, mm. I, we could feel it. It's not just, we just yeah. see it, yeah. we just feel it. It's yeah. real, mm -hmm. right? And the empathy that you build for real with that uh, other individual, mm -hmm. just meeting them. You didn't, you, you were in training, but you were like just listening and mirroring mm -hmm. and being open and being really yeah. empathetic beyond words. I know like I'm, I'm a first, only first year student, I'm only my second semester and I've been listening to a lot of words, right? And mm -hmm. a lot of words and we're doing a lot of embodiment, but the real thing is when you get to the actual word, if you don't really listen <laughs> with your body and your heart open, mm -hmm. like nothing happens, right? Or you can make a difference. So mm -hmm. how do you step out of the actual verbalizing and theorize the theoretical part mm -hmm. of the work into really meeting the person yeah. where they are and just be humble that mm -hmm. that that mirror where and i see you yeah. and you see me and we meet mm -hmm. in this space where yes. there is no power yes. where where two humans communicating mm -hmm. and trying mm -hmm. to create a difference yeah. in this work mm -hmm. and going from there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. would anyone like to comment on, on actually what do you do today to stay humble, to stay present with these uh, wonderful uh, observations and questions that Idalmis has brought into mm. the space. I like this idea of being humbled. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The fact that this is an, an ongoing discovery. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, as, when we meet these, you know, these people that, that we serve, uh, realizing that, you know, that we, what separates us is not that much of a gap. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and having that sense of humility and how uh, a privilege we are mm -hmm. in relation to, to, to that experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I might really appreciate that. Yeah. I would also say, I mean, it's a therapeutic relationship. Relationship, mm -hmm. which means that there are two people in encounter with each other. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talk about sitting with, um, and sitting with is not disembodied at all. Like everything lands on the body, in the body, with the body. And so I think, you know, that, that humility sits with in the space when we allow ourselves to open in the action of the work, right, in this embodied uh, way of working ourselves to what is happening. Because these things, whether we brought them into the space or not, they were already happening, mm -hmm. right? And I think the humility comes when we allow ourselves to recognize that I am in relationship with mm -hmm. someone, someone that impacts my life, right? Like it's, it's, we don't just walk into a room and walk out unaffected. Um, you know, one of my dearest colleagues says actually that people that we work with, they move in, they live with us, and they travel with us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so true. And so to serve the relationship and find the humility to say, we are in process together, is so important. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna open up the same question up to the audience. Um, would anyone like to share an observation, comment, a question? I'm gonna pass this microphone this way. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> if you're comfortable 
<laughs> My name is Robert Landy. I'm the uh, role theory person. Um, <laughs> a role theory person, not the role theory person. I got to I got to speak. I'm 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 dying to speak. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and I need to defend words. I desperately need to defend words. Yes, drama therapy is unique as it, it is an embodied process, as the dramatic experience in some ways transcends words. However, <laughs> number two in the role, theory, uh, role method process mm -hmm. is Name. called naming the role. Yeah. Shakespeare says, a rose by any other mm. name would smell as sweet. If you called a rose cat piss, it would not smell as sweet, I guarantee you. The words are very, very important. I heard the word love yes. 25 times. Mm. And when it w every time it was uttered, it was uttered with great meaning. Yeah. Not every time with the same meaning. Yeah. but every time with some meaning. When I heard the word mirror, it opened me up. Um, I, I was able to see through both sides. Mm -hmm. uh, images can be expressed in movement, in sound, in drawing, and so forth. And images, I think, most deeply, in my knowledge of the universe of psychotherapy, are most profoundly expressed when they are given the word. In the beginning was the word. Mm -hmm. The word is, um, is as essential to me, from my, my point of view as a, you know, a person who has stayed in this whole notion of role and story, it's as essential to me as a physical expression. Mm -hmm. That's not to say that they're separate. But to say, as, as we often do as drama therapists, that a wor words are less than an embodied experience, to me, no longer makes any sense. Uh, so I needed to say that. Mm -hmm. And I heard, and the final thing I want to say is that the presentation tonight was so smart. And one of the reasons, in my, in, in my opinion, why it was so smart is that there were so many words attached to what mm -hmm. you did mm -hmm. and so many ideas behind those words stemming from Sarah's beautiful introduction. Mm -hmm. So I applaud not only your bodies, <laughs> but also your words. <laughs> <Indeed>. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Cindy Mena, um, and I found out about drama therapy about like six months ago, and I went crazy. I'm like, oh my God, it exists, it's a job, it's a job. I had, I had all these things, like I want to do this, I want to do this, I want to do this, pick one. I'm like, I can't pick one, I want to be a writer, I want to be an actor, I want to be a show, you know, I want to be a therapist. Pick one, and then I saw this, and I was just like, life changing. So I'm going through like my own moment, I'm just like, taking this all in, and I see that a lot of you guys have like a very big, I hope I don't cry. <laughs> a very big empathetic. I see like a lot of you guys have like what I feel like I have like this like this heart, like this heart for life and I hear you guys talking about taking your clients in and like embodying them. And I know that that could be a lot sometimes. It takes so much sensory and like you take things like I feel everything very deeply, so it's like easy to do these things and I find like how do you guys taking all that in? How what what is your process like to clean out like mm -hmm. Once you, because it, because it is, it can get very personal, and you want to get, you want to get that deep. It's something that you find, like, very, like, almost, like, soulful for you. Like, so I want to get that deep with a client. I want to get that close. I want to get that embodied so I can help them. But then I'm like, when is it too far? When is it where you, you know, when you love them a lot, stuff like, when do you go home, and not take all that with you, you know, or being able to like have a, a, a normal life, or just is that mm. not happen to you? <laughs> is it gone after you start? Like, that's what I want to know. Because I, I feel like... I, I, hope not. I don't know if you guys want to ask that, but I think... It's a great question. Yeah. I, I mean, I can answer a part of it. Yeah. Um, I think the, this idea of um, 
I would not engage in this process about every client, right? I, I don't have the capacity and my body couldn't take that. But there are certain clients within our care that will impact us in some way. And it's those individuals that sit a little bit differently or are coming home with us at night. Those are the ones that I would probably take extra care and engage in a process like this. Um, the, the embodied case narrative process you saw this evening also has a self-supervision version as well. And it's something that I do for myself. Um, and so I can answer that. And I think it goes back to the humility question. Um, I, I, I can't do this for everybody. Um, and I, I try my best to show up in the same way for everybody, but I, I actually don't know if that's wholly possible. Um, and I have to trust and train my body to be prepared to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and to also acknowledge when, like I, I actually can't bring everything that I usually bring into a session that day. Mm -hmm. um, and being able to name that, naming the role, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? is useful for me. Mm -hmm. So it's just a little yeah. bit. I just want to quickly say, but I'm also curious if other people have thoughts, that I actually think sometimes this process is that process, mm -hmm. um, that in fact, in moving with something, it allows it to move through. Um, and so that sometimes the process that you're talking about of like, this is sitting with me, how, what can I do with this, it is to actually move through it. Um, and also, uh, speaking of naming, it's why I say at the end, I have to ask what's being said. I mean, what we've done is an actual, I mean, it's a verbatim of our process. And there was a moment when they were sitting and talking to J JB, I actually said, I have to ask what's being expressed so that it could be given name. Because actually, sometimes when something is sitting within and we're like wrestling with it and we feel it and it's there, but it doesn't have name, it can't be grounded. And as Dana spoke to, the L word is actually something that we don't often speak to in this work, but I think that we need to because I've, I've noticed both with my students, but also I will name in my own process of becoming a therapist that love is something that sits in a very unsettling way because it's not talked about a lot. And so it's why in our process when, when this was happening, I said I have to ask because I really did have to ask so that what was in the space could be given name. Because then we can say, oh, as Sarah would say, and there it is. <laughs> and that's the work. <laughs> we like replay this for Sarah all the time. You're carrying Sarah around with you. Anyone else have a comment or question? Alexis, can we pass this over? Thank you, everyone, for the work you showed us tonight. I just wanted to say to Dana and Britton for bringing these models, um, what I, one thing that I witnessed in both of the ways that you work with supervisees that I think is so important is that um, we saw in both demonstrations the anxiety and the fear of like, am I good enough? Who am I as a clinician? Yeah. Like, am I going, like, and all that that lives in the body and that comes into the room and you both, took the tools that every drama therapist naturally has in their body and as artists and as writers and as performers, you use those tools and you give them back from a place of power and a place of strength and like their identity and say, here, you know how to do this. Now translate that into the work and bring that into the room. That's what I witnessed at least and I think that's so brilliant and that's sort of what we're trying to do with our clients too. So that was lovely. I, one of the best things a supervisor ever said to me when I was like so anxious about using music, is this, is this drama therapy? And she was like, that's your language. You, that's a language you speak yeah. as mm -hmm. yourself. So that's the language you bring into the room. So I saw you do that with all of these mm -hmm. instances. And yeah, just, it's beautiful. Hello. Uh, Dana, you mentioned this just a second ago, but I was curious about um, both of these methodologies, right, being utilized um, and modulating between self-supervision and group supervision and how they shift and change between the two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> how they shift and change. Both of these processes exist in a way that they can be done independently. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think the caveat I would add to the self-supervision part for the embodied case narrative is that you need a witness. So ultimately, when you are engaging in this type of process, I think we want to make sure that some, somebody is witnessing the experience. Um, because you do need that mirror that we've been talking a lot about. Um, I think some of the concrete things that are different, there's less people in the room when you do it. Um, and so within that, I know for me, I can get stuck because I'm with all of my thoughts, all of the different <coughs> roles that are sitting in my head. And so I have, actually have to be pretty diligent about how I'm dividing my time when I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. um, and that compartmentalization is useful for <coughs> me. And that can take a variety of forms. Like it's, I'm, if I'm just sitting with one metaphor, I'm gonna just like live with that metaphor for a moment. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's usually with art, with painting, mm -hmm. and usually with my hands because that just feels viscerally right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that answers your question, mm -hmm. but um, that's <coughs> some of the things I'm sitting with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. Oh, sorry. Okay. With the RRAP, um, similarly, I mean, there's a lot more um, written response and usually a prompt for creative writing, which I actually do consider an embodied process because yeah. it takes the body um, on a journey. And so um, there's a lot with you know, the written word, which is, is a way to kind of think about so what we saw put in space would be done on paper. And I, if I'm doing this in my self-supervision, am writing from some of the roles, perhaps a story, uh, bringing several of the roles. Perhaps I'm writing a poem, perhaps I'm writing something, but again, a way to use the creative process um, to then see well, what is here so that it can be given um, more understanding um, name. So that's probably the biggest difference is that here we move it right into um, the action, whereas in a self-supervision it's, it's much more in the creative processing. I'm, and I'm happy you said that because I think in self-supervision you have to have some level of process. Yeah. And the way that it's outlined for an embodied case narrative is it follows the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. So it starts with the therapist using things like a role sort to begin to understand who they are in relationship to this individual. And so it's using some of the tools we would use in the clinical mm -hmm. space, in the treatment space, and using them on yourself, mm -hmm. um, always holding in mind this image of the other. Mm -hmm. um, and so it follows that, like, step one is, you know, who's the, who are the heroes on this journey? Mm -hmm. And then what are the obstacles? And who's the guide? And where are we going? Um, and it's more systematized. Mm -hmm. I think I'm going to bring this portion to a close. And I just want to say, I know we're, we're in a time right now where there's... Um, well, gosh, you could complete that sentence in so many ways. <laughs> there is so much happening. <laughs> what I want to draw attention to is the, mm. the increased interest in creativity and the arts and mental health. Mm. And we have this extraordinary panelists, panelists, panel of drama therapists and drama therapists in training. And you've given us so many different examples of the ways in which we can bring more of ourselves into an exploration of what it means to care with and for one another uh, in different contexts in schools and in inpatient uh, settings uh, and in supervision within a, a clinical training program. So thank you so much for your work this evening, for sharing that here with us on this stage. And thank you all for your comments and questions. Thank you.